Okay, we're going to spend some time talking about Bitcoin today. We are getting some more. It's it's a, Bitcoin is the gift that keeps on giving because it teaches a lot of things about investing uh, that basically are just evergreen concepts. And what we're learning now is a concept that also shows up in equity investing in the stock market, where you want to also you want to be as aware as aware as you can about who's in bed with you, who is alongside you holding the same asset you're holding and what are their motivations. And uh, so so just as an example, if you were to look at, say, a relatively small stock, like a small cap company that is not that liquid and somebody who's a large holder needs to get out of it. Maybe they have, um, you know, too much personal debt or they're leveraged somehow, or maybe there's a hedge fund whose book blew up and um, they need to blow out of all their positions, right? And this has happened, this happens repeatedly in equity markets. You have some firm that gets under duress. Everybody can see that they're under duress. And because there's public filing requirements, you can see what their top positions are. And so you will have people who will buy puts or shoot against this large investor's top holdings because you know that they need to sell these holdings as a source of funds to make good on whatever debts they have to make good on, right? Uh, and, and of course, in the equity markets, large investors have to file 13F public filings on what their major holdings are. Uh, companies themselves have to file information about who are the top holders of their shares. And of course, you can go to Bloomberg or various other sites and find out who the top holders are of any given company. Um, likewise, the company filings will have this information too. And so one exercise that you do as an investor is you look at who's in bed with you if you're going to be buying the stock and what might their motivations be. Are they, are they long-term shareholders? Are they short-term shareholders? Are they maybe shareholders who might be under duress at some point? And you can draw conclusions from this. Um, some of them might be conclusions like, wow, if somebody gets, if I really like this company, but if somebody gets shaken out hard, you know, or is, has to sell, be forced to sell, it's going to crush the price. And so I should be ready to buy more if that happens, right? So I leave some buying power um, on the table for me to buy later, right? I keep some cash handy to acquire more if this is a stock I really want to own. And I think that um, there might be an opportunity to get more at a much cheaper price, right? And when you have an illiquid stock, it may not take a lot of selling pressure uh, to move the price a lot. And this is something that actually we're learning right now with Bitcoin. The thing about Bitcoin is it's not small, right? Even after it's dropped by two thirds from its most recent high, the Bitcoin market cap is still something like $400 billion, still very, very large. However, the actual free float, the amount of shares that are kind of available for frequent buying and selling is relatively small compared to the, the total value of the, the overall asset, the number of Bitcoin times the price. So, and, and why is that? Well, that's just because there's a lot of very large holders, specific wallets that are identifiable on the blockchain that have never moved, where the coins have never moved. And so there's a lot of holders that are very, very long-term holders. Of course, we don't know under what circumstances those coins might get sold. I mean, if, if Bitcoin went up 10 times, I'm sure some of these coins would get shaken loose and sold back. Um, but much of the supply of Bitcoin is in kind of very strong hands. Uh, but that means also that perhaps someone who is a motivated seller and when there's a float that's relatively thin or relatively small, you can act actually disproportionately move the price. And probably that's what's happening right now. We've had a couple of uh, lending platforms. We had Luna, which is a stablecoin pl stable platform that collapsed. Celsius is collapsing or has collapsed. Um, there's also some rumors going around about Three Arrows Capital that is kind of involved in both of these platforms, experiencing some duress. And uh, so, so it turns out we have levered players that are involved in Bitcoin. And this gets to another nuance about Bitcoin, which is there's no filings, right? There's, you know, some whale that has a gazillion coins in some wallet doesn't need to file anywhere. There's no central database of top holders of Bitcoin. I mean, there's a, a blockchain that's observable of pseudonymous wallets, but it's not, we don't know who the people are and we don't know their vote motivations. And we, it's not like with, um, you know, the top 10 holders of a company where we can look at the balance sheet of each of these investors, if they're public companies or hedge funds, and we can sort of make a judgment about how levered they are, right? So you don't really know too much about who's in bed with you in Bitcoin. Obviously, there are a lot of strong hands involved in, in the asset, 
but on top of that we have a pretty thin float we don't have a lot of coins that float and provide sort of moment-to-moment -moment liquidity in Bitcoin at least relative to the, the, the total pool of assets right so if you have a, a significantly motivated or forced seller you know let's say like you know both Celsius and three arrows capital have to blow out all of their coins in a relatively rapid time frame or maybe there's some smart contract on some lending platform that automatically liquidates people this can move the price you can get very aggressive sell-offs or or like spikes upward in price too and so this is just something to think about when whenever you're making any kind of investment you always want to think about who's in bed with you who who's alongside you and what their motivations are and sort of the the robustness of their personal financial situation or their company financial situation because that might play into a forced seller at some point in the future and of course the nuance with Bitcoin is we don't really know much about who it is that we're in, involved in who's in bed with us and some of these people may be more levered than we thought and the asset itself may not have it moment moment to moment liquidity to enable kind of forced selling to happen in an orderly manner okay so what are the takeaways well first of all stay liquid right always be in a position where you can buy more Bitcoin because you never know when you're handed some glorious opportunity like you know the price collapses from 40,000 to 20,000 now of course it could collapse more right I don't know what the price of Bitcoin is going to do and I don't want to get involved in whether it's a good time to buy it here or not more that just be ready when there is an aggressive sell-off make sure you have your thinking already lined up right you you want to make sure okay have you made a decision about whether this is an asset class you want to participate in what kind of time frame you're doing it in uh, doing it over and when there is a dislocation do, are you ready are you ready to buy and take advantage of it and if you're able to answer all those questions this volatility actually plays to your advantage it's actually not a disadvantage because it gives you situations where you get potentially glorious buying opportunities to buy an asset that you wanted to buy anyway right so here's a concept it plays with equity markets it plays in any kind of investment market really uh, and of course it plays in Bitcoin with the added nuance that it's a little more um, opaque who's in bed with us but be prepared for opportunities okay thanks as always for watching